Hi, my name is Adam Matalon. I'm an award-winning television executive producer, creative storyteller, and the CEO of Message HQ, a brand story consultancy. On my episode for the Business Growth Architect Show, we'll be discussing how revealing those skeletons in your closet and those past experiences, both negative and positive, can be the most powerful way to connect with your business peers and customers. Business, personal story, and creativity are the only way to create a truly authentic connection. Listen in to hear my thoughts. Welcome to the Business Growth Architect Show. I am Beata Chalet. I am the host. I want to welcome you to our globally top 10% ranked podcast, where you will hear from industry experts about the strategies that are working right now to unlock hidden opportunities in any market so that you can grow your authority and scale your impact. And now let's get started with the show. Hello and welcome back. This is your host, Beata Chalet, and today I'm talking to Adam Matalon. And we're going to be talking today about something that you all have been wondering. Creativity. How do you discover your creativity? How do you use creativity? And what's the value of creativity? Adam, I'm so freaking excited to finally get to talk to you on the show. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm equally excited. I'm grinning from ear to ear because I've been really, really excited about this conversation. So for somebody who has never heard about you, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, so my name's Adam Matalon. I am an award-winning TV executive producer, a creative storyteller, and also the CEO of Message HQ, which is a brand story consultancy I started about a year and a half ago. And that's that's me. I've been, I've been a professional storyteller uh, for the last 22 years, uh, working in, in TV and film and advertising, and but predominantly in television. The first question I have for you is why do people have such a problem with putting value to creativity? Because most people that I ever talk to, when they have a creative child, they immediately proceed to beat it out of the child and go get a real job. What is this love-hate relationship with creativity? I think a lot of it has to do with creativity is associated with a lot of failure. And what I mean by that is when we're being creative, we are thinking, we're coming up with ideas, many, many of which we almost, I mean, I say this myself, uh, we kill immediately. We'll come up with an idea where they go, mm, no, that doesn't work because here, the, the creativity we hear about as, as a society is the successful creativity, right? So, but for every successful creativity, there are hundreds of instances of, of failure. And I think at a human level, one has to teach oneself the courage to fail in that word. It takes many, many ideas to come up with a good one. So I think that's part of it. So I agree with you that the creativity, I always call it a double whammy, because when you're creative, you have to figure out how to hone your craft and you have to run the business. So it's almost easier if you were to just run the business or you learn how to be a professional without the creativity because then you only have to deal with one thing. Is that a true statement? I think it can be a true statement. I don't think it's the best statement. And I don't mean your statement. I mean the, the grand statement. I think that especially in business, and I see this with a lot of startups that I'm consulting with or, or talking to, there is this rush to kind of find the perfect solution and not to dig deeply and be patient with a group to understand what actually is it that drives us. And so I think if, if one's just running the business, then you're just saying, okay, we've got a solution for X, let's just go out and do this. But that story, that creativity, the way they think about that product is the way to potentially scale that business over time to take that business and find secondary and tertiary revenue streams because they haven't thought about it globally. This is what I found so fascinating about talking to you because you have a way of articulating this. Because what I heard you just say is that you can't really separate one from the other, which is exactly where I wanted to go in this conversation. In speaking in Simon Sinek's words here, if that if that core element doesn't exist, you're just a machine because you're trying to execute something that comes from logic and tactical decisions. 
So now in the work that you do, I assume that you go to people that have this flirtatious love for the term creativity, but they don't really know what it is because they beat it out of the organizations that they're in. So they know they need you, but they don't really quite know. Now you come in. So tell me what typically happens. I'm sure there's a process in place where you have to help them to even open up their hearts and minds and souls and intuitions. Well, it's interesting because I was asked a question last week about, you know, sort of my sales funnel. And I don't use that phrase for, for the work I do because my response was, well, people come to me. I'm just constantly sort of saying what I have to say, speaking, you know, when I do a speech or a keynote or make a presentation, people will have an aha moment, right? Because I'm really passionate about what I do, clearly. And, and I love it. And in that moment, the, those clients who probably are right for me have those aha moments and they go, oh, you know what? I heard a few things that are red flags for me in the way I'm thinking about things. Uh, and I, th I think that's what tends to happen. Um, in terms of the actual work, there has to be trust. There has to be uh, a frank exchange because some of the conversations will sometimes be drawing attention to a person or two or three people that I, Adam, don't think you're thinking about this in the right way. I'm seeing opportunities that you're not even seeing because you're just blinkered. So let's step back. And it's one of the reasons why I really love to work primarily with founders, because I believe so strongly that if they don't have this vision to catapult themselves out of bed every morning, to catapult their companies, how can they communicate that to their team, to their PR and marketing, uh, in, you know, organizational structure, whatever that may be. So back to your reference to Sinek Cynic's why. I have immense respect for, for what he's talked about and he's brought this concept to the business community. But if we go back to oral history, if we go back to theater, if we go back to any creativity, the why is the question that Shakespeare was asking. <laughs> the great, great um, writers of, of history, have, they're asking not only wh wh why am I doing what I'm doing, but why are these characters, what is the human condition? Why are we here? Yes. It's, 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 yes. it's big, right? So I really, I want to shake people when I work with them. I want them, I want them to work. I want their brains to hurt because in that, in that pushing through those plateaus is where you get to that place in which creativity can take place. I feel the same way. That's the first question I, I ask everybody I work with. I said, you know, what do you want and why does this matter? And it is the simple question that already is such a such a challenge because they don't know how to answer that. So can you give us like an example on how you make somebody's brain hurt? Because to disrupt the way somebody's regular brain pattern or regular thinking works, how do you go in? It begins, I think, with what we alluded to before, somebody seeing a missing link in what they are trying to do. And I think in, in many cases, it, it is them coming to me to say, so how would you resolve this? Or what do you think? There's a company that I just got involved with that I'm really excited about. They're a startup and I'm working with them both as a consultant, but also on the sort of foundational team. And I, I've, I've taken us almost fractional CMO position with them. They have developed a revolutionary aerogel product which uses this breakthrough patented science and technology and this new magical recipe. And those are my words, which are solving an endemic longstanding challenge across many er areas of the construction industry, right? Now you go, oh, what? Boring. I mean, it's, it's basically aerogel materials have been in installation for years and years, but there've always been problems with it. One of the things I have done with the, the two founders and the CEO is to force them to understand and to think about the fact that this is not a building material. Like, what are you doing? You're providing comfort and cost reduction 
to the end user, right? So what you, what your product is doesn't matter. The result of your product is what matters. And suddenly in thinking about that, they've made a human connection to something that is an inanimate building material. And they understand that how we will go to market, how we will sell and how we will find traction is that we'll grab hold of people because people will go, oh, I can save money and be more comfortable. Who doesn't want to understand? Who Who is not interested in, in understanding at least a little bit more of that? And we're just at the starting point. So, but getting them to that point, getting them to a point where I could say to them, the name of your company is terrible, which I literally said to them last week. I said, respectfully, I, I'm excited about this product. This name is terrible. We cannot go much farther. They're at seed round now. They're going to A round. There's a lot of interest. We cannot continue this way. So what are we going to do? And we start this conversation about what is it? What does it do? How do we think about it? Then you start comparing it to other names in the market. This is hard work, right? And now I've got the CEO and he and I are both, we, our brains are hurting. Uh, but this is the process. And is also, it's, this is not something you agree on a Monday and you solve on a Thursday or you solve by end of day on Friday, right? Part of the thing I say, I'm going to go away. Let's think. Let's come back with ideas. Let's go away again. So I love this word ruminate, and a lot of people don't use the word ruminate, but I love language and ruminate. You, you let things bubble in your head. And sometimes in the middle of the night, you'll wake up and you go, oh, there it is. Well, doesn't it always happen when you're not in it, but when you step away from it? So do you want to tell us a little bit more about how you experience or how would you describe the creative process? Because I think that's another thing that's not been defined is how does the creative process work? What is it? We as, as a society, as a culture, you know, in Western civilization, we live in, we live in a noisy environment, right? We have, we have social media, we have, we have our LinkedIn and our Instagrams and Facebooks and all this stuff. We also have an expectation of instantaneous response to emails. Uh, you know, these are the norms. I don't think creativity can fully take place in that environment. So I think that for business people, for people leading teams, companies, whatever, you have to give yourself space and you have to know that your brain's capacity to think outside of the everyday is not only governed by you giving yourself peaceful time, but it's also governed by what you put into your brain outside. And, and as an example, to, to personalize that for myself, I have an absolute rule that I, I have an alarm that goes off seven days a week because I don't want to get confused. And it goes off. And in the morning, my rituals include my yoga stretching, my making of coffee, which is a big deal in my world. And, and then I sit and I read and I read, um, classic uh, novels and literature and words that are not common to the time I live in. And what that does is it allows me to learn words and often I'm on my Kindle often. So I see a word I don't know. And I type it. And I see what that is. And many times it's not used in common language today, but it starts to have your brain think in this more global way. And it's, it can be done that's just my way, right? Some people can go climb to the top of a mountain, but I think shutting off again, sometimes I just shut off. I have recently personally shut off for about two months. And in that time, I've been observing the world, thinking about things I want to talk about. I'm being so verbose and I apologize, but it's about a push pull between space and time and pushing your brain in on, you know, outside of a, a normal box. So that's where creativity is. It's, it's, and so many people have different ways. Do you want to garden? Do you want to make things? Do you want to paint? What is it that has nothing to do with your day-to-day -day work that gives you happiness? 
that isn't your children and isn't your spouse and isn't your dog. I, I watched this documentary from Tony Robbins, I'm Not Your Guru. And what really stuck out for me is the routine that he has to get into this particular mindset to go out. And it clearly is something that he's perfected over the years. So you see him meditate, you see him do his cold plunge, you see him take this three drops of whatever it is that his assistant puts in his mouth before he jumps on the bounce of four times before he goes on stage. So there's a a very specific, a very specific routine. And what stood out for me is that there was, and I've observed this with a lot of successful people, it's almost that that is their path. That's their proven way to get themselves to a particular place. Add something to that, because I think that's really important. It's Is it the routine of it? Is it that you have figured out your personal hack on how to get you in that mindset in this space? What is it? I think it's exactly what you're saying. I think it's creating a routine that gets you to a place you want to be while also making sure that that routine is pushing you a little bit, is incrementally pushing you forward. Uh, there's another book I love, um, which is Atomic Habits and, and this idea of, of stacking small incremental habits on top of each other. So yes, everybody has their way. I just had this sort of argument with a dear friend of mine because I was I was saying, why can't you force yourself to do 10 push-ups every time you go back to your desk? Because I have this habit, right? I leave my desk and I, I if I go to the bathroom, I go get a cup of coffee or do whatever. I come back to my desk, but I don't let myself go sit back and let, till I've done 10 push-ups or 20 push-ups. And it's silly, but if you incrementally think about that over the day, you end up doing quite a few push-ups. Uh, <laughs> and he, and he said to I, me, would, I would postpone going to the bathroom if that was my routine. <laughs> but he said to me, he said, oh, but you managed to do everything you put your mind to. And I said, no, no, I don't. I really don't. I said, I'm inherently a lazy human being. And I just tell myself that it's not about the push-ups. It's wanting to create this routine that gives me a peaceful place where I can be excited about life in general, even on a bad day. You know, I'm, 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 I'm an eternal optimist. Even on my worst day, I'm like, well, today really sucked and tomorrow will be better. And if tomorrow will be better, then the next day will be better. Exactly. And uh, we will be right back after this message. Are you looking for the hidden opportunities for you in this market? Or are you simply wanting to figure out what is your unique differentiation factor that makes clients want to work with you and not your competitors? If this resonates, I want to invite you to go to uncoverysession.com and schedule your 15-minute complimentary uncovery session with one of our business growth advisors that will take you through what your number one business growth blocker is, what you can do to remove it, and what your very best next step should be. And now let's get back to the show. Whenever I talk to you, Adam, I, I can't help, but I'm, I'm just like grinning from ear to ear because I find this so fascinating. Now, why is it for, so difficult for people to do the things that they said they were going to do and then they don't do that? I don't think there's anybody out there that wouldn't agree that meditation is not important. Myself included, I find it very difficult to keep a meditation routine. It's easier for me to walk, which is a form of meditation, and to listen to something while I walk. So I have learned to try to not judge my pattern. I know yoga is amazing. I just don't like it enough. Is it important to stick to something that is proven or do we have the freedom to make adjustments? And is one thing better than the other? And how do I figure out what works for me? For me, again, I think it goes back to finding those things that make us happy. Um, and I use, I'm thinking of another friend who is a really fine craftsman in the sound engineering world of television and film. He is such a beautiful woodworker and that is his hobby. And that is meditative for him. I love to garden. Like I really like to garden. Often in my most stressed moments, 
I will go out and dig. I, I weed other people's gardens because it <laughs> makes me happy. When I'm at people's houses, if I see weeds, I weed <laughs> other people's gardens. And, but joking aside, I mean, that's true, but I always say to people, gardening is my church in a weird way, right? I, I get so meditative and, and I just, I get at one with the earth and dirt and and i you know if i'm digging i see a worm i'll save a worm you can't save every worm this is the truth (laughs) Um, but it really comes down to people you have to want to find these places the other thing that you and i have talked about that i wanted to um put a little bit of um oil on the fire here is thought leadership the idea of thought leadership today is the internet marketing idea that has been said a thousand times. Muhammad Ali called himself the greatest boxer of all times because he just said he's the greatest boxer of all times. So I'm a thought leader because I call myself a thought leader. What's your opinion on thought leadership? And is there a difference between what people call thought leadership and what real thought leadership is? I think there is a difference. I think that thought leadership is sometimes being the only voice in the room with that opinion. I think it's being disruptive. It's forcing people to think about uncomfortable things. Yes, it, it, some, sometimes there is truth that the person that shouts it first and shouts it loudest wins. But I, I think we can all look around the business landscape and we see a lot of thematic repetition. And I think it's great. Listen, if, when I, I see things sometimes on LinkedIn, I'll be like, you know what, that's really good. And I'll share it or I'll make a comment because I'll, I'll think to myself, you know, that's a really powerful, considered, provocative and potentially dangerous statement and opinion. And I think that, that is, that's where thought leadership, I think that we have confused often thought leadership with what I call cheerleading, which is you know, people going out and going, you can do this. You've got it in you. You have the power to succeed. And there's a fair amount of that um, out there. It's difficult because one of the things I talk about with our personal stories, a brand story is especially in the world now of AI. AI cannot tell a, a unique story about you, Beata, or me, Adam. It does not know how, because it isn't us. It's one of the only things that we as companies, as people have 100% control over. And so thought leadership is also about saying, this is what I think. This is how I think about it. And if you agree with me, wonderful, join my tribe. And if you don't, that's okay too, you know? Why do you think that is that... I? So if thought leadership is defined as a, an idea that I unapologetically present as my own, because that is how I feel about it, because I think that is what thought leadership really is, without fear of being challenged or a fear of being ridiculed and saying, well, no, you guys are, this is not not how I see it. Why are people so afraid of of voicing their opinion. I have a theory about this that, that that I'll share, which I think is a lot to do with the educational system because we raise people in teaching them existing information and then we make them retain existing information, regurgitate existing information, and when they do, they get an A. So we train a whole generation after generation after generation in status quo. How do we break out of this to achieve real thought leadership? Because if we would assume anything in the age of AI and what comes next. It's only the most brilliant innovations and thinkers that are even going to be able to tell the machine where to go because these algorithms have to be written. And so how does this whole next thing, I can you, now my brain hurts just thinking about that. Like, where is that going to go? Like, what do we need to do now to help people to start to think in a different way? Because there's no way this industrial revolution thinking is going to work. It's a very, really difficult subject. Um, I think that when we think about AI, first of all, yes, it is, it is as good as the data 
that we feed it, right? Academia is an interesting place, right? Because there it's built into the structure that one is supposed to be disruptive, that one is supposed to challenge the system. But the problem is that when people make this decision to move into business and then it's revenue driven and one must fit into a certain way of doing things, if we back up to... I don't know, can't even remember when it was, but we back up pre-internet as internet started to come into to being. And I guess, what was that, 90, the 90s, early 90s, mid 90s? And uh, I've been looking at this from a business perspective because everybody at the time was saying, oh, my internet's going to come on and all these people are going to lose their jobs and this and that. And well, lots of people did lose their jobs because of the internet. And but here we are in 2023, and would any of us say, oh, we we're better off without the internet? No, we are better because of the internet. So yes, hundreds of thousands will, of people will probably lose jobs because of AI. But here's the beautiful thing. Human beings, we remain for better or worse, and often for worse, at the top of the food chain. And why? Because we're one of the few species who have the ability to adapt at speed and to innovate at speed. So those people who don't adapt and don't innovate of themselves, they unfortunately will be left by the wayside, uh, which is a shame, but there will be all of these other people who adapt and thrive. You know, we, we sort of get back into sort of Darwinian stuff, right? Because we're talking about survival of the fittest and, we still live in that world where fundamentally those who are fittest mentally, emotionally, physically push themselves forward. That brings us back to creativity, which is how we started this conversation, because ultimately, is it the creativity now that if activated properly or if tapped into is what is going to set you apart because knowing history on how we did this with outsourcing to to China. So I think that humanity will do exactly the same. They're going to outsource everything and have AI do everything until they realize that AI is not going to go to the restaurant. Uh, a, a robot will not have a meal and a robot will not get a massage and a robot will not drive a car because there's no purpose for it. And a robot will not need to live in a house. So unless we pay attention to what we've learned in the past, which I'm not hopeful about uh, looking at what's going on in the world right now, we are going to go all the way to that side only to realize that what we've done is detrimental to ourselves. Is the only solution not always creativity of people that have this ability to not think about how do I cut cost? How do I make this more efficient today? But also the visionaries, the thought leaders of the future, is that not what where you come in with the creativity? I think I do. And, and, and I hate to be immodest, but I, I think if you think about what is creativity, huge shifts in society were almost always driven by creativity. And let's think about it. The, the Renaissance period was driven by art and music and culture and a completely different approach to relationships and political structure occurred out of that. The industrial revolution also came out of creativity because it came, part of creativity is dreaming. And people started to dream about what if I could speak to somebody at the end of a electrical line? What if I could get an engine to drive without horses? What if I could build a car? What if I could fly? You know, these people, all of those, you know, names synonymous with the industrial revolution and innovation, they all dreamed of what if. We dreamed of how does man get to the moon? So if you homogenize society, if you homogenize thought to a sort of status quo, soupy, genericness, <laughs> making up <laughs> weird words now, uh, you, you, you can't. So it will be left to the dreamers and, and the people who go, no, there's, there is, 
there is this thing we can think about. Why are we happy with just the way it is? And I, so I think dreamers and creativity always come from a place of there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way. But I'm thinking about it. Dreaming is so much of a part of it, right? You have to dream of, uh, of, of, a, of a solution, of a, of a day. You know, <laughs> I recently did a video using sliced bread as a basis for a, to, to a structure of a pitch. And I was basically pitching sliced bread because to me, it amused me, right? To think of, well, what if we li had lived in a world where you just sawed up a big loaf of bread into chunks and that's how we ate bread and for hundreds of years and then suddenly somebody invented sliced bread. And so I was talking about the structure of how one would pitch sliced bread. But that's what I mean. I mean, somebody dreamed that up. We didn't always slice bread, right? I actually use the analogy of the sliced bread and have been for a concept I created called egorhythm. So I'm, I'm cracking up. The sliced bread is, is an analogy that you have found because I also am using this analogy of the sliced bread for concept. And that is the creativity that we were talking about is that when you have a concept and you have a idea or you need to bring a story to someone in terminology that they can understand. It is never about the features, which is what you talked about earlier with the building material, the aero, aerogel, but that it is about understanding on what this thing is going to be used for and what problem it actually solves. And then telling the story in such a way that people say, now I get it. Because if I just talk about an aerogel, that means nothing to me. But if I talk about something that's going to make my house and no longer have drafts in the winter around my window. Let's say that would solve the problem. Yeah, exactly. And, and th this solves all of that. But, you know, here's an important thought that just to interrupt you, if I may, for a moment, this story of creativity and stories also driven by who we are as people. And so much of what we do as humans is we, we pitch, right? Whether you're founder, you're pitching for money, you're pitching a concept, or you're pitching a group of people in a team meeting about something you're gonna do next week. And a lot of people have this innate fear. And again, it's like, oh, we get up, we're gonna do the PowerPoint, and then we all get death by PowerPoint. And you know, there's all words, 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 and we all shut down. I believe so strongly, and this is something I do repeat again and again, each of us have at least two or three things that influence everything we do about how we approach life, how we approach work and play that make us really good at what we do. And a lot of the time, we never talk about those things because they're so innate to us that we almost take them for granted. And part of the development story for me with clients as people, but also as brands is to say, well, what are those things? And how do we talk about them? Because in talking about those things, you suddenly get an audience to go, oh, wait, this is, this is not like every, I, I, I'm interested in this person because this is, this is an interesting person. And a good presentation creates a second conversation. And that's something I talk about a lot, right? Because business doesn't get closed in one conversation, but you want to get a second conversation, whether you're pitching to, you know, an investment group or, or a team or for a job, you want people to go, oh. What did you just say? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, explain that. Like, can I, can I know more about that? I think that's exactly the piece. Um, and I would like to, to close our interview with that because I think this is a really phenomenal takeaway that encompasses everything we talked about today is that there is a part when you're not afraid to speak and you voice an opinion that the only way to make an impact is to garner attention or to get somebody's, wait, what? That is that. And then you need to lean into that. Do you want to add a little bit more to that? You just said the most important thing. What is the objective? You want people to lean in. You as a presenter, whether it's you and me together or me and 10 people or me in front of a thousand people, you want that power and authority. You want to feel that audience going, what? Whoa, this is cool. And so often it is about 
throwing away the perspectives, throwing away the norms. Maybe it's starting with a story. Um, and that's a lot of the work I do, but it's, a lot, it's not brain surgery, right? What I'm talking about. It's like, I love doing it with people. And if somebody heard this podcast and said, oh, oh my God, I must work with Adam. Wonderful. And that would be amazing. But this is work that people can do them by themselves. Our jobs as presenters is to charm an audience. It is to grab them. It is to delight them and tantalize them so that they want, they're not going to go back and go, oh my God, did you go to that meeting? Oh, I had to sit through that half hour board meeting. Or I had to, that pitch was terrible. Great company, but that listening to that person was like watching paint dry. It's our jobs. That's our jobs is to get out in front and grab people and have them lean in. Last question for you. Do you think that as you get older, that part becomes easier because you just don't care what other people think about you? Is that, is that a fear that we lose as we age and we become bigger, better at what we do? I am, I'm torn on that question. I've been debating this with myself because I think that, yes, you don't care what people think about you so much. But I think as we get older, at least my experience is that I often realize that I have become more fearful in certain areas about just leaping off a cliff. Now, it's something I'm really conscious of. I think back to when I was, you know, early 20s and I'd just knock on somebody's door if I wanted a meeting. I'd call somebody up. Cold, I mean, not cold, cold pitch, but it's like, oh, I want to meet you. Can I want to come in and talk to you about a project or I need your help? Or you're just fearless. I have found that I have sort of lost that as I get into the machinery of a particular industry. And I'm, I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years, like reteaching myself courage. So it's both for me. It's, you, you don't really care what somebody personally thinks about you because you're like, eh. but then you also sometimes step back and go, well, maybe I shouldn't. Whereas I'm like, you know what? If somebody doesn't like it, they should have the courage to tell you. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of the um, sales processes are going to. And this is the stuff that I really study is to allow that to happen, to say my job is to put this out in front of you, to, to the extent of the clarity for you to say yes or no. And either way, I achieve my goal. A hundred percent. You cannot spend your day worrying about result. You can only worry about objective. And as long as you achieve the objective of presenting the information, the result takes care of itself. It's sort of what they always say, you know, build a good company and the money will take care of itself. Most of the companies not making money out there don't have fundamentally good companies. There's something wrong, right? That is almost always fixable. Takes us round robin back to creativity. Why are we not looking at it a different way? You know, how are we not spinning the ball, looking at it from every angle, looking at it from above, looking at it from below? How do we solve the problem? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. So for somebody, Adam, who now is your number one fan? Where do we send them? How can they find out more about you? Uh, so everybody can find me. I am Adam Matalon on LinkedIn. Great way to find me. Um, I, I do not keep my email address a secret. It is adam at messagehq.net. People are more than welcome to email me. But yeah, LinkedIn and, and email is the uh, best way to get me. I, I always jokingly say that if you go on Instagram to try to find me, you will see nothing about work. You will see a selection of, I hope, comedic videos of, that I make from around the world. <laughs> I will check it out and I'll, I'll let you know my, my opinion on this. Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time and talking to us about I creativity. I could talk to you for hours. This is so much fun. Thank you so much for being here. And that is it for us for today. Thank you so much for listening or watching the video. And until next time and goodbye. This is your host, Beata Shalit. Thank you for listening to or watching the show. We are so excited that you're here and we are very grateful for you. Now it's our turn to ask you for help. Please do share this episode with one other person that needs to hear what we were talking about today. 
if there's any question you have about business, please do reach out to us and let us know. And don't forget to schedule your complimentary uncovery session at uncoverysession.com, where one of our business growth advisors will help you to figure out what your number one business growth blocker is in only 15 minutes. And that's it for us today. Until next time. Oh, 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 oh,